Hi, everyone. My name is Cheryl Crooks, and I am Executive Director of Cascadia International Women's Film Festival. It's my pleasure to welcome you here today for a panel discussion with the filmmakers of our three indigenous films in this year's festival. We're so proud to have these films in our festival this year. We have two documentary short films, one made by Jules Kustashen and one co-directed by Ellie Smith and Daryl Hilaire, and a narrative feature directed by Marie Clements. Moderating the panel today will be Elizabeth Weatherford, who was the founder and the director emeritus of the Smithsonian's Film and Video Center for the National Museum of the American Indian in New York. It's a wonderful discussion about the indigenous filmmaking process, and I think you're going to enjoy it, and like myself, learn a lot. But before we get to the panel, I'd like to first thank the sponsors for this year's festival, including KCTS and Crosscut Magazine, the City of Bellingham, Whatcom County, the Mary Redmond Foundation, and Eileen and Steve Nelson. And all of our sponsors and donors, we want to thank you because without you, this film festival would not have been possible. So without further ado, let me introduce to you the panel and Elizabeth Weatherford, the moderator. Enjoy this discussion. Hi, everybody. I'm so pleased to be here with you in this very strange format because generally, as you all might know, seeing your own films in theaters, feeling the room is part of the experience. We can't actually sense each other so well. So let's have a good conversation and talk to some extent about your individual films, but also about collectively what you as women as indigenous women, as indigenous women filmmakers, think about the nature of telling stories, and to my consideration, how films can affect change in the world. How indigenous films affect that is even more significant. So let's begin. Each of you might give a brief introduction of yourself and the film that you're going to be screening in the festival. And why don't we start with you, Ellie, and perhaps then you can, you can pass it on to your partner. Sure. Um... Hi everyone, my name is Ellie Smith, and I just have to start by saying that I myself am not indigenous to this land, but um, I partnered with Daryl Hilaire, who is. Um, so yeah, I'm just was really grateful to um, be able to help share the story in um, Women of Journeys. So yeah, just had to start with that. Um, just grateful to be here with everyone and to, to share this time. All right, Daryl, how about the story line of Women of Journeys? How did you get involved with making that film? Uh, first off, uh, uh, Children of the Setting Sun Productions, we've been in business for like four years. But Children of the Setting Sun has been around for over 100 years. It was started by my great grandfather as a song and dance group who went out into the world and told stories right around when uh, native spirituality was outlawed. He put on his paint and he put on his paddle shirt, picked up his drum and gathered his family and he went around the Pacific Northwest to let the people know who we are and where we come from. And so from that point forward, it, uh, he, uh, he passed that on to his, his kids and the grandkids and I'm a great grandchild. And um, we've all were left with the instructions to keep his fires burning. So we do that. Today's medium is doing that with, uh, with film or with books or with stage productions. And Ellie and I and our team, we uh, took it upon ourselves to document uh, Canoe Journey this year. And once, once it was over, we uh, had to decide how we were gonna tell the story of Canoe Journey. And it became very obvious during that time that it was gonna be about the women and the murdered and missing indigenous women was, was uh, the story that came through loud and clear all the whole week that we were there. Um, there are many spirits that gather there at Canoe Journey. There's a lot of healing spirit. There's a lot of spirit in uh, the old way. There's a lot of spirit of reconnection. But this one was the one that stood out. So we, uh, we had that story come to us. Thank you. Obviously, the connection to ceremony and the place it has in, in Native tradition, but also in indigenous resiliency. 
is something that comes up in all the films. But Jules, I'd like you to talk about that a bit because your film is so strongly around that topic. Tell us about your film and how you came to make it. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Watch Jules Kostachinina and Kisini Kasun on Awapaskat and Totim Maskwani Totem. So I'm Barrett Clan. I'm from Ottawapaskat First Nation in Northern Ontario. And um, my film is Ashkiki Shigao, which translates to a new day. And essentially it's the second part of my first CBC doc, which is Niso Tewak, about the twins who are exploring their Cree identity as twins. <laughs> and then this is their coming of age ceremony where they cut their hair for the first time. So we were um, heading back to our home community to do the ceremony there. And I was talking to Leslie at CBC and she's like, hmm, that sounds like a good idea for a film. <laughs> so then we got the crew together and we shot the ceremony. Um, so it was, it was really interesting. It was hard because at first you feel a bit vulnerable, right? Putting your personal stuff out there for the world. So, um, but we made sure that we followed product protocol. Um, when, the, when the kids were having their first sweat, like obviously we didn't go into the sweat with the cameras or anything. Like we just were really cautious about um, going about, about the actual ceremony itself. Yeah. Thank you. And the connection between several of the films is going to be talked about in our conversation. Marie, however, tell us a little bit about Red Snow and how you came to make this very impressive narrative film with a storyline that is particular to our current moment and also has great hearkening to the themes of ethnocentrism and violence that have been part of each of the stories, both documentaries and narrative. Tell us a little bit about Red Snow and how you came to write it and direct it. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Marie Clements, and uh, I have a company called MCM, and it's really great to see everybody. Um, great to see you, Daryl and Jules. I wasn't, I don't know what I, who, what I was expecting, but <laughs> Zooms are so, you know, interesting that way, so what a great surprise. Um, I'm from the West Coast, uh, and I uh, have uh, lots of family in the Northwest Territories. Uh, and really, I was, Red Snow came, uh, I was looking at a photo uh, journalism uh, a bunch of pictures taken back in 2009 uh, around the war in Afghanistan and uh, just felt that in certain angles the indigenous people there uh, look similar to our indigenous people uh, from the Americas and uh, was wondering what kind of dialogue these two peoples that uh, came from ancient cultures and had survived so many wars uh, what that dialogue might be. So Red Snow starts in the Arctic um, with a Dene soldier who ends up in Afghanistan and taken hostage by the Taliban. And he uses his family, memories of his family and his identity to survive uh, and to escape with a, a new family, a new, a new ideal family. Thank you. Um, all of you have had to face special challenges as indigenous filmmakers. And I'm interested in how, uh, in the processes of making your films, you encounter those challenges and how you overcame them, I guess, is what I'm asking. Uh, what about you, Jules? Uh, I think there might have been some specific things that relate to moving from one place to another place to the community from which your mother came. Uh, what were the challenges you faced? Cost. <laughs> it's very expensive to go to a fly-in community. Um, we had to fly across from Vancouver. My mom was living in Ontario at the time scoop up my mom and then we flew to where did we fly to Timmins and then we flew to Moosonee and then we flew up to Ottawa <laughs> so it was very expensive uh, that was a that was a big hurdle but um, we had a very small crew as well so we only had one one guy um, he was doing uh, cinematography and sound <laughs> and then we had my oldest son Asavak who was our PA so and then we just got the kids to do stuff as well. So a lot of our budget went to traveling. Um, but it was worth it. I think, I think having that very, very small crew or one crew um, actually helped us kind of navigate through the community without like, you know, shedding too much light on us while we were shooting. Because it is such an intimate personal story. Right. And the twins, you know, like they were turning 13 and you know, and it's, it's a big deal for them and to have a camera there shooting this 
you know, them cutting their hair for the first time. They were really shy. So I thought it was really important that they develop a relationship with the DOP. And of course their older brother was there. So um, I don't know if there was so many challenges. It was more just kind of taking the lead from the twins, you know, and seeing where their comfort levels were and stuff. But, you know, kids today are so comfortable being in front of the camera anyways, like their whole life is in front of the camera with their phones and tablets and so forth. So, yeah. Well, Asibaka, Asibaka is a wonderful connection between two of the films. <laughs> yeah. We'll talk a little bit with Marie and with you too, I guess. Marie first, how did you find Asibaka in order to cast him in your film in the instrumental role of the young Guichen man who becomes the, who's a Canadian soldier in Afghanistan. Well, we did a pretty extensive casting, you know, um, from Vancouver to Edmonton to Toronto, New York, LA, um, to uh, Yellowknife uh, and a lot of small communities. But uh, I had known um, of Asabak through theater and, um, and then I just asked him to come in. So I was pretty, uh, excited to meet him and he has such a an amazing quality as an actor um, you know he's obviously very beautiful he's a beautiful son Jules um, but he also has such a deep quality a, a sense of self and a, um, he carries himself um, really well in the world and that's really what I wanted uh, for other people to be inspired by for other you know young men to look at this other young man and see kind of the strength and resilience and uh and he has um i don't know i just i wanted someone that had a deep quality to it because it's easy to go oh he's a soldier let's just do this you know soldier thing but um as uh representing you know indigenous men as a soldier i felt it uh it's important to find um the quality that resonates uh on deeper levels I think another thing that happens in your film, Marie, is a real reflection on cultural considerations of women. And most of these films, most of the three films, deal very strongly with how community settings and knowledge of one's traditions can sustain you. But you can also have the problematic there of a young woman wanting education who has to hide. Your film, why don't you talk a little bit about that and then we'll go on and talk some more about that topic. Yeah, I, th I think, you know, it is, I, I guess it's a little bit strange for an indigenous woman to write a war story in some ways, yes. but I, I felt it was, you know, it was much more than a war story as war is, uh, you know, often it's, it's a lot of things. And I felt that I really wanted, uh, even though the main characters uh, are male, I wanted them to be uh, influenced by uh, their version of the world, which means as an indigenous young man, I felt that, you know, we could feel um, the strength uh, that, that women gave him. And yeah. basically they, you know, they guided him and they still help him, even if they're not there. And I felt, you know, having, having that really strong presence of his first love, having the presence of his grandmother, played by Tantu Cardinal, and also meeting this other, you know, young woman um, whose culture, you know, whose uh, political world uh, had worked to try to suppress her, uh, you know, as a woman in the world. It was great to feel that connection because we could see that he could see her in yeah. a very strong way. And I think those kind of layers were um, exciting to, uh, you know, investigate and also pull through the narrative. In Women of Journeys, the theme that you selected to pull to our attention as audience was the theme of missing and disappeared Indigenous women. And perhaps you can talk a little bit about shaping, the shaping of the purpose of all your documentation towards that particular uh, concern. Uh, uh, Ellie edited the film and we, we gave some directions around that, uh, shaping it around things that were culturally appropriate yes. and uh, things that, um, you know, the people in the panel were saying, you know, so those are just kind of like the two guiding principles. Even though Ellie's not from Lummi, she's been around Lummi a long time, so understanding the cultural protocols is pretty important, you know, in our community. So we took care of the people. You know, we fed the people, we uh, 
the care of the elders, you know, those kinds of things. Um, so in that way, the challenges become, um, uh, they're lessened quite a bit if you know how to fit, your, fit within the community. So I'll let Allie speak to the part of editing it and how that came together in her mind when she had those kind of guiding principles. Um, yeah, I think Daryl said it before that the story really came from the people and he said the, you know, the Lummi Nation really, um, they brought out the theme of honoring the missing and murdered indigenous women. So we were really just there as witnesses. And then, yeah, we sort of created this story um, afterwards in a way. It was kind of a reverse um, documentary process because we knew we had to film it and we knew important things were happening. So we just sort of directed our attention to um, these strong women leaders. And then afterwards, I, um, yeah, I just sort of sat with the material for a while and um, kind of felt what came from the heart and like what resonated on that level and pulled them together that way. But yeah, the story really came from the people themselves. All right, so you've chosen the format of documentary. In fact, it begins, as you all said, uh, as documentation. There are two documentaries in this group and there's one narrative film and it might be interesting to talk about which form selected by you best suits the kind of stories you're trying to tell. So maybe Jules, you can talk a little bit about choosing documentary. I know you do poetry. I know you do many kinds of creative formats for telling stories. Why a documentary film? What does that do? I think it just captures life in real time. So, you know, you can't really control the outcome of documentary, as many of you know. <laughs> and so you have, you're, you're kind of there filming and all these magical things kind of transpire in front of you. And when you have the camera rolling, you're like, yes. <laughs> so for me, it's that kind of element of surprise when you're documenting something unfold, because life is like that. We never know. We have something in our head. This is how it's going to play out. And then when you get there and start filming, you know, your story goes in a whole other direction. So I think for me, there's magic in that, that we're capturing, you know, these beautiful moments in life. So um, we had so many moments. We had such a great cinematographer who was just like had the camera rolling the whole time. And we had so many great moments, you know. So for me, even though they half of them didn't make the film, at least I have them documented. And in a way, I see documentary too, indigenous documentary as an archive, you know, for future generations to look back upon, right? So I think it's such a powerful platform. And um, in a way, it sustains our cultural ways. In a way, also, it captures us trying to weave some of those lost pieces together, you know? So... Mm -hmm. For me, that worked for um, Ashkiki Shigao, you know, obviously as a documentary because, you know, we're documenting this event that was about to happen. So. And, and Re, you absolutely choose a different path with your film, which is that of creating the characters, creating the narrative, even creating it yourself. So what is the, how does narrative film fit into a picture that you carry? What is the best way to tell a story? That's a good one. Okay. Well, I, I think that, you know, I, I think we probably all understand that at a certain time, the story chooses you. And, uh, and usually it, it tells you, you know, how it wants to be told. And I think there's so many great storytellers in our communities. And I, I believe that cinema is, is one of the, you know, ways that stories are being told. And I, and I love that it has access to a larger community and that you know our filmmakers are taking that space and the craft that they've you know uh, they've not only most filmmakers i know that are indigenous are also other things you know they're singers they're they're dancers they're uh you know poets they're theater makers so it's really intriguing to see um people bring their skills to that art form and I think they're pretty profound skills because it's, again, it's not just going, oh, I, I went to film school to become a filmmaker. No, you know, there's people that started singing and then they went into, you know, traditionally, and then they might have went into theater and then they went into writing. So I love that. I love that. It's a, it's a multi-skilled um, uh, thing that you need as a director and as a, um, a narrative storyteller 
but it's also I think it's it's a little bit of an act of uh, revolution to be able to bring our stories to the screen in the way that we believe them to be not something that's put upon us as usual <laughs> something I, also, yeah. I also saw in red snow something that's related to what you described as the background for a filmmaker who's indigenous which is your film has so many layers of of contexting where you are and i think in each of the three films the place the, the, the necessity of place, the, the significance, the intrinsic significance of place is so well portrayed. Marie's film is in a different place from where her character came, but she switches back there and creates his place so beautifully. At the same time through the musical score creates the sense of the overlay of Aboriginal Canada with Afghanistan and Pashtun culture. It's really, it's very interesting. And I think all of you have in your films seen your native place as an important thing to convey out to audiences who see your films, as well as something that Jules just referenced, which is archiving that sensibility and that significance of place through the very act of documenting itself. So, uh, I'd like to ask you a question about being filmmakers, and that is, who taught you to be a filmmaker? Who was, what, who's the important, I would say, indigenous influence that helped you become the filmmaker you've become? Where is that transition or transmission taking place for you? Um, I, I think I came, I, you know, I started as an actor and I started young as an actor. So I think that the, the world of imagination, the world of possibility um, is just kind of intrinsic for a storyteller. So what better world than cinema? So I was just really lucky growing up that I uh, mentored under a lot of um, uh, older actresses and, and uh, uh, you know, really, uh, centric and, and amazing uh, coaches and that kind of motivated me to uh, want to be better. I don't, I, I'm not going to say one, but I tell you, you know, people like Margot King, people like Tantu Cardinal, um, Dady Rutherford, which was my first uh, drama teacher, um, Peter Hinton. I mean, there's a whole list of people that lent uh, their ears and their, their hearts to me uh, so that I could uh, create um, a body of work through theater. That really was, you know, it was a profound training ground for me because theater is really hard and it's really hard to get produced in this country still. Um, but it, it trained me really well um, to survive with as much grace as I could. <laughs> and how about you, Jules? Who, who do you consider your teacher in becoming a filmmaker? Um, I don't know, that's a good question. I think, you know, as a child, I had a hearing impairment for a lot of years as a young person. And so I was living in my imagination for a long time. <laughs> so, yeah. and then also I was raised by my grandparents up in Northern Ontario who did not speak English. So mm -hmm. I was around storytellers all the time. So it was very natural. And like Marie too, I started in theater as an actor. Um, mm -hmm. But you know, I think we're so fluid as storytellers. You know, we just find what works. And I think part of the spiritual part of being a storyteller is kind of also letting the story take the lead because it carries agency, right? And it tells you how it wants to be told. So we have to kind of be um, open to that process. Because sometimes, I don't know about you all, but Sometimes you're like, you have this idea in your head. You're like, oh, it's going to be an amazing installation. Yeah. And then it just like, you try and you try and it doesn't work out. And then you get offered to kind of make it as a doc or a narrative. And you're like, oh, okay. And wanted to take this other route. So, but I think it's just, um, I love the fluidity of it. I love the freedom of being able to tell a story in different platforms. And I'm always open to that. So I just like, you know, doing my thing. <laughs> And I think yeah, you're going to talk a bit about how the origins of the performance origins of the thing that you're ending up doing in a, in a, in a cultural organization that deals with many different forms. But what's interesting to me is that you decided to do, you're moving it towards film, from performance in person, let's say, towards filmmaking. 
what, what do you think is the purpose of having documentary films about the Lummi culture and the Lummi um, experience that this film shows? Well, there's two things and they're, they're kind of uh, pulling in opposite directions. One, there's this emergence of our language and of our culture within the Coast Salish territory. Mm -hmm. And it's really beautiful to witness that emergence. Uh, I grew up at a time when uh, there was hardly any of uh, our way of life shared with uh, ourselves or anybody else. Uh, fishing was uh, almost extinct. Uh, people didn't speak the language. There was only one or two. And then, um, you know, uh, there was only one dance group. And today, like at Journey, there was over 100, you know, 100 canoe families. The language was predominant there, you know. So we have that. But on the other side of things, you know, uh, the resources are vanishing. You know, we're a fishing community. And last year we had one day of sockeye fishery. So we're documenting that. We're ca capturing the hearts and spirit of our fishermen. And we're doing a salmon film about that. You know, we need to do something about the environment. So we feel the best way to make a contribution is to film it. It's a fight, but it's also a celebration, you know. Yeah, that's a wonderful way. To, it's a fight, but also a celebration is a great thing to say about all of your films. Yeah. The forms that you've worked in are very distinctive and the films that you brought to the festival are extremely beautiful and powerful. Um, my take on what you've talked about today is that the connections that you've all drawn are to the resiliency of indigenous culture and I think in this moment when we are in fact encountering this pandemic affecting the global culture, it's to indigenous people we can look to see resiliency in action. What happens when you face so much that's been the heavy, heavy burdens of historical actions that leads to resiliency? So I kind of want to end our conversation on this. Filmmaking is a form of having the word, of saying what it is in a kind of indisputable fashion in front of an audience. What, what do you consider your audience's needs are from your films and how do you think your resiliency as filmmakers making these difficult works will serve as a model for the next generation? Some of you are intentionally working with young people in film, and some of you understand that your films and film process are engaging young people. So I'm kind of curious about the question of resiliency, the subjects of your films being resiliency, and how you imagine this being something audiences can walk away from this moment, being informed in no other way that I know of by the agency of indigenous people by the assertion of indigenous people of control of their own history? Um, I've always seen filmmaking as a way to shine light upon something. So to me, it's been my favorite platform to um, draw attention to something that um, is of great importance. So um, yeah, it's been one of the greatest honors of my life to be able to work with the Lummi community and specifically with the youth. Um, Daryl and I have been working well Daryl his entire life but me for the past ten, um, about 10 years with Lummi youth so um, yeah getting to collaborate with them and we had two young other filmmakers Hillary Kegi and Michelle Pulaski who helped with this film as well and um, yeah I'm constantly astounded by the resiliency of Native peoples specifically in this community that I get to work in um, and I just used film as a way to to share that. So it's pretty basic on some level. And um, I also resonated with what Jules was saying and how art has a way of, it has its own spirit and being, and it's almost like you just have to listen um, and you'll hear it. So yeah, I, I, I think it's absolutely correct that we need to look towards the ways of indigenous peoples and um, the way they, respect the land and respect everything and I think I think we can get through this together if we remember some of these teachings so just honored to be here with everyone. And how about you Jules? Resiliency and the way you want to make your films or have your films seen. Um, 
for me, I think filmmaking goes beyond the screen. Like, for example, I have my TV series, ASCII Boys, where we went to 13 different Native communities. So it was around following protocol. Every elder that we met, there needed to be some sort of exchange. Um, and all the activities were led by community as well as my older sons. And so now I know that my kids have a home in 13 different Native communities. And now as CVAC has worked with Marie, and we laugh about it because I'm like, yeah, there's your new auntie. <laughs> She's got her eyes on you. So I know that we're, we're building a community and we're building a web of relationships. So films go beyond what we see on screen, especially Indigenous films, right? Because they kind of, um, they, they transcend time and space. So Marie's film, your film, like all of our films are going to be seen in the future, right? And so we're going to be, like I said, archiving or documenting a certain time and place, which is really beautiful when you think about it. So it does carry that life. So I think in terms of resiliency, my particular work, I'm, you know, I go back to my home community. We have a high suicide rate and the kids are just being inundated with like images and media that's all about death. And it's like, okay, let's talk about something else. Let's talk about life. Where do you see yourself in two years? Where do you see yourself in five years? Let's talk about who benefits from the future. Do you see yourself represented in the future? So these are hard questions, but I think in all of our work, we're kind of addressing that resiliency, if that makes any sense, because we're the ones in charge of telling our stories. We're telling the stories that matter to us, and we know the gaps in storytelling in our communities and what our community actually needs. So I think we're addressing that subconsciously, maybe, <laughs> through our stories, but there's a lot of hope in our stories, too, so, which is very different than a lot of the stuff that we've seen about us. And how about you, Marie? How about that? Um, I think I think the idea, uh, I mean, I always loved reading about James Baldwin when I was younger and it kind of served me and, and I look at other filmmakers and, you know, including everyone on the panel and going, what we're saying, we're, we're telling the truth of our time. So we're bearing witness to uh, not only our past, but what's happening right now. And that's, that's something up um, in films. And I, I love that it has that kind of energy. Um, and I think it is resilient because Indigenous peoples are resilient by nature. That's just kind of ingrained in who we are and who our ancestors are. Um, and I feel, you know, for cinema, really, I think what we're trying to do is appeal to people's heart, you know, to make people feel something really is the sure way that they can open themselves up and change can happen. And I think um, storytelling in that way um, helps us become bigger people. Uh, and more the same and less different from each other. So in conclusion, let's start with Daryl and then go around to everybody else. Daryl, in conclusion. I'd just like to thank everybody for their good words. Uh, the uh, thing that jumped out to me was what Marie was saying about truth, you know. Uh, your, uh, your job as a moderator is to kind of walk us towards that in a lot of different ways, you know. And uh, when we talk about protocols, we talk about um, um, uh, inviting ourselves in to document uh, what's, what's taken place. A big, a big part of that is a responsibility when you talk about resiliency. We're born with a gift and our responsibility is to, to, to practice that gift and share it and covet it and pass it on. So all of that is, uh, is a strength, you know, if you could realize that and respect it, you know, these things that uh, we wrestle with as, um, are, it's a less of a wrestle, it's more of a dance at that point. And uh, we, we've been able to do that because I'm not a filmmaker, I'm a retired uh, politician. I was on the council for 15 years and I started the Lummi Youth Academy and did that for 15 years. That's where I met Ellie. So in that walk, you know, I, I recognize these things that we were talking about today. So I got inter interested and now I'm hooked. <laughs> Thank you. And how about you, Marie, some last thoughts? Uh, yeah, just in conclusion, just want to thank um, 
everyone for their words. Um, speaking about trying to fight for your next story, um, sometimes that gets a little tiring. So I just thank you for the inspiration and I feel a bit uh, more, more strong. Is that even a thing? I feel stronger and, and just really inspired by seeing your faces and your words. So um, Masicho, thank you. And Jules, how about you, the last words? So I've been um, at this festival, I think, since the beginning. <laughs> I have another film for next year about menopause. Woo -hoo. Um, no, I'm really thankful. I love this film festival and um, so close to home and I love everybody there. It's just always such a great experience. So thank you for um, inviting me to be part of this panel. And hi, everyone. <laughs> it's nice to see hi. your faces. Chimi Gwech. And for me, it was such a pleasure spending some time with all of you, both through the films that I got to watch a few times and also to spend in this conversation. You're really quite wonderful, talented people and you're giving to your communities and to the rest of us who are audience is very deep and profound. Thank you. Thank you very much.